Okay, good evening. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1 to start. While you're turning there, I'll remind you where we've been the last few weeks and where we're headed tonight. Romans chapter 1. We'll go down to verse 17, read a couple verses there in a minute. So going back several weeks ago, we had a message or a few messages on astronauts in the Bible. People down here who made it up there, but far beyond where our astronauts go. And then we talked about some folks from beyond that made their way down here. And then last week, it was not people, it was things that came from up there to down here. This will be a part two. So just to remind you, last week, we had these four that we made it through. We had rain. The first thing you see in a Bible that comes from heaven to earth. And it was the flood of Noah's day. We see rain today, but not near like it was then. And then we made our way over to Genesis 19 and not rain, but fire and brimstone. So just those three things, fire, rain, or, or rain, fire, brimstone, that is all God's wrath poured out here on earth to a certain group of people, a certain time period. Okay, then we went over to Exodus 9, and we had hail mingled with fire. Fire is a theme here. There's going to be more fire tonight. And then I ended on a good note last week, if you remember. We had the manna in Exodus 16, from heaven to earth, God's bread to nourish the souls of those Israelites. So, here's number five coming up after we read. So, uh, Romans 1, 17. Romans 1.17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So notice the contrast. Verse 17, the righteousness of God and in verse 18, the wrath of God. And notice it says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from where? Heaven. Hence the reason why we have seen last week and some more tonight, so many instances of objects or rain, fire, hail, so forth, from up there, down here, and it is a demonstration of God's judgment and his wrath. So with that in mind, we'll start off with a very unique one. If you would go to Joshua chapter 10, this will be number five. I believe I've got seven all together here, so I think we've got enough time to get through three more. Joshua 10. I did prove on Sunday night that I can actually give a short message if you didn't notice. I think it was under 35 minutes. First time ever, but hey. One in a thousand is not bad. Joshua 10. Joshua chapter 10. Go down to verse 7. Joshua 10, 7. Uh, the, the book of Joshua is a real neat account of God's power against the Israelites' enemies. He works on behalf of these Israelites, and he uses Joshua in a great way. So go to verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal. He... And all the, all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Now watch the next couple verses. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones. Where did they come from? Great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. Notice what it says here. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So do you think God was against these people, these enemies of Israel? 
for sure. And did you notice the little, the little side note God gave us, obviously on purpose, that the hailstones killed more than Joshua and his men. I believe, the, if I had to guess as the reason why, God wanted to remind them he's the one that does the work of defending them. So they were obviously involved, but God on a, in a much mightier way. So these hailstones, as I read, I thought to myself, I wonder how big those hailstones were. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. However, there's another place in the Bible where some big hailstones come down. And it hadn't happened yet. Revelation 16. So this is number five. Hailstones are great hailstones. Revelation 16. And over here it actually tells you something specific about how big these might have been. Or actually how big they were. Can't really say exactly on size, but there's something we can say about it. Revelation 16. Go down to verse 21. This is in the tribulation. So you know this is God's wrath poured out. 1621, last verse in chapter 16. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blaspheme, blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. So a couple things about that. Number one, that's a really sad statement. God's wrath being poured out. God actually trying to get the attention of people. And what do they do? They blaspheme God. Notice that they actually give God the credit for being the one dropping the hail out of the sky. People today won't even acknowledge that there is a God. These people do. It very well looks like they recognize God is against them. Okay, so something about these hailstones. Every stone was about the weight of a talent. So I checked, uh, checked online and I have a note in my Bible that actually matches. A talent, at least about 80 pounds. What were you thinking? Okay, so I got 80 to 90, very well could be. So I don't know how big, but I'll just tell you this. I have in my garage, one of the things I used to work out that'll really, really give you a workout is a, a kettlebell. You say, what's a kettlebell? It's, um, it's round and it has a handle. It looks kind of like a kettle. That's why they call it a kettlebell. So I have one that weighs 50 pounds. And I will take that thing and press it over my head from time to time. And I hate doing that because I think to myself, what if I drop this on my head? <laughs> so I make sure that I don't do too many repetitions or else, you know, muscles get weak. So 50 pounds on my head would definitely knock me out even if it was just dropping this much, uh, it would hurt. So with that thing being, and again, it's smaller than a basketball, maybe uh, around the size of a soccer ball. I'd say that's probably pretty close. Maybe a little smaller than a soccer ball. That's pretty good size for a hailstone. That's a big, that's a big object falling from the sky. And if that hits you in the head at 80 plus pounds, what's gonna happen to you? You're not just gonna have a concussion. You're not going to wake up from the concussion. So those are some big hailstones. I don't know about Joshua's day. I do know how God's going to do this in the, in the future, though. And for hailstones to knock people out and kill them, you figure they had to be pretty good sized back in Joshua's day as well. So there's the first one there. There's hailstones coming down from heaven. Great stones. Okay. Now, the next one is got several examples. We'll try to look at a few at least. Got a bunch here. But let's go to Leviticus 9. So change gears here. The next thing that we see sent down by God from heaven. And I believe all of these tonight are associated with God's judgment. Yeah, pretty much for the most part. Last week we had the manna that was not so much God's judgment, it was God's blessing. But by and large, you see God's judgment coming down from heaven. And that's why we saw Romans 1, the wrath of God revealed from heaven, literally in these instances. So Leviticus 9, I suppose if we had to put a blessing on one of these, we could with this one, but I have to explain that. So let's read first. Le uh, Leviticus 9, verse 1. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, 
Take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. Okay, now watch verse 4. Also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering mingled with oil. Well, watch this part. For today the Lord will appear unto you. So where does the Lord show up? Well, let's go down to verse 22. Skip down the end of the chapter. Verse 22. After Aaron offers all those sacrifices, let's see what happens. 22, Aaron lifted up his head, his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Watch 24. And there came a fire out from where? Before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. All right. It doesn't say specifically fire from heaven. We'll see that in some other instances in a moment. But it does say fire out from before the Lord. And I have seen this depicted with pictures. And I've seen a, a guy do a really neat picture of the tabernacle. And then he's got this flame from way up in the sky coming all the way down, consuming that sacrifice offered inside the most holy place. Could be something to that. Sure sounds like that's a good possibility of where that flame came from. Now, how is this? Let me uh, ask, ask for your input on this. How is this fire from heaven, fire from the Lord? How is this? An instance of God's judgment. How so? It's burning up that sacrifice. What does that indicate, Brother Mark? God sending that fire. What does that indicate? He accepted that offering. So the judgment falls on the sacrifice instead of the people. The Israelites, you know, don't miss that. God's judgment fell on the sacrifice instead of the people. Now, are you saved? A couple people out there saved. If you're saved, the judgment of God was placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ instead of you and me. Amen. So when you see that in the Old Testament, that's God accepting that offering. And notice it's no accident that it's fire. Pastor did some Sunday school lessons here recently on fire. So a couple things to remind you of. Number one, well, I mean, let me just ask you, get your wheels turning. Fire, what, what comes to mind? When you see fire in the Bible, what comes to mind? Hell, I was hoping somebody would say that. Probably one of the first things that comes to most folks' mind when they think of fire in the Bible is hell. What happens in hell? It's obviously hot. But why do people go to hell? They're suffering God's wrath. They're paying for it. They never get out. They're paying for it forever. So God's wrath, God's judgment. Now what else you know about fire? Exodus chapter 3, we won't go there, but what else you know about fire? Oh, you're going Israelites. Yeah, there you go. The, the flame of uh, the pillar of fire. Yeah. How about Exodus 3 where Moses sees something very unusual? Yeah, and the Lord speaks out of that bush. Then you go to Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 13, and it says, Our God is a consuming fire. So fire is a representation of the presence of God. And at the same time, it can be God's judgment poured out. Very interesting, isn't it? So, any, any other thoughts on fire there? Are your wheels turning a little bit here? Anybody else? Okay, some more things about fire. There's a whole bunch of these, but let's look at a couple. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 1. If you're reading through your Bible and you hit this, you've you got to get a kick out of this. Uh, how this all progresses in chapter 1 of 2 Kings. I will uh, try to get down to the nitty gritty here. There's a lot we could read for background, but let me see if I can get to the nitty gritty. 2 Kings chapter 1. This is Elijah, and these fellows come to him, and they're sent 
to him. Uh, chapter 1, 2 Kings chapter 1, um, they're sent to him, these messengers by, I'm trying to look and see here, it looks like possibly, okay, the king, yep, I was trying to see the king of Israel, okay. So go down there to um, verse 8, uh, verse 7, this is a conversation with these men to the king, and he said unto them, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him. He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So look what the king does. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him and behold, he sat on top of an hill, on the top of an hill. And he spake unto him, thou man of God, the king has said, come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from where? And consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So there's O for 1. Let's look at the next fellow that shows up. Verse 11. Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. There's over two. Let's see how number three does. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came, down, there came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. So look at 15. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. All right, so what do you think the fire is an indication of there in that passage? God's hand upon Elijah. It was really a sign and wonder performed by Elijah. To show that he was truly a man of God. So that happens twice. The third fellow says, hey, I'm not going to go down with the fire. I'm going to try to do this a little bit better. And he obviously makes out much better. Uh, he humbled himself. That was the big thing that he did different than the other two fellows. So there's fire from heaven indicating God's mark on Elijah. Okay, how about another? Go over to 1 Chronicles 21. There's a place over here in 1 Chronicles 21 where David is in some trouble. And the whole nation is suffering because of something he did. And as a result, God says, I'm going to give you three choices here. He said, as far as what the punishment's going to be, he said, oh, I'll just take whatever you give me, basically. And this is at the end of that. So 21, 26, a whole bunch of people die as a result. And we're at the end of the chapter, 21, 26. And you'll see this is similar to what we saw in Leviticus. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. Watch this. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. Watch the next verse. The Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. And if you look at the verses before, this angel is ready to destroy more. David runs to offer this sacrifice, and because he does so, the Lord accepts it. You don't want to miss this. Because he accepted, or because he offered that sacrifice and it was accepted by God, the angel no more destroyed the people. So it's God's wrath pacified once David offered the proper offering. So here again, you see something similar we saw in Leviticus. The offering, God's wrath is poured out on the offering instead of David and or all the people. So I know that when you read your Old Testament, you probably think, man, all these offerings, all these sacrifices. Hey, the reason why it's so often those people understood the wages of sin is what? And if the animal didn't die, they would die in their sins. So I think that. I think we're spoiled today. I know I am. I think about this because I don't see something like what we read here. 
we oftentimes takes, take God's grace for granted. And we're kind of flippant with the way we live. We're a little too casual. These people saw death because of their sin over and over and over. Some of them saw their friends die. Some of them saw, take the animal to the, to the tabernacle and that animal would die instead of them. So I, I think we're, we got to look back at the Bible to be reminded in the Old Testament, this is what God did. And has God changed folks? He's the same. He still does not tolerate sin. His wrath ultimately in time will be poured out on sin. Now you say, how come you got all these wicked people walking around and God hadn't taken care of them yet? That's the grace and long suffering and mercy of God, giving them a chance. But if they reject Jesus Christ, sooner or later, the, the wrath's going to fall on them. So good to read these Old Testament accounts and just be reminded of who God is. Second Chronicles 7. How about another? Second Chronicles 7. This is Solomon. You remember Solomon built a temple and then obviously what did he do once he got the thing built? He's offered some sacrifices. So if you look at verse 1, 2 Chronicles 7, 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, here we go. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and, sacrifice, and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So notice this is the second time we've seen this, the glory of God going hand in hand with God accepting that sacrifice and indicating that he does so by fire. Now watch verse two. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Wow. It's quite a scene. And look at verse three. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Folks, what was it that caused those people to be so humbled before the Lord? It was that fire falling. They knew that God was there and that he had accepted that sacrifice. And it was either he accepts that sacrifice or they pay for it. And they were thinking and praising the Lord as a result. Hey, have you thanked and praised the Lord for Jesus Christ paying for your sins lately? Something you ought to do on the regular. Uh, every day, if you think about it, you ought to do that. Okay, uh, how about we end on a real high note here? I know it's a lot about God's judgment, but hopefully you're seeing God's blessing in there as well for the person offering the sacrifice. The sacrifice is consumed instead of the person. So let's see how this applies to us. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1. Last thing we'll talk about here, things coming from heaven to earth. And this just happens to be a person. You probably know who it is. 2 Thessalonians 1. I want you to see the wording of this, and I couldn't believe... I mean, I, I say I couldn't believe it. it was just really astounding when I put all this together and I saw this verse just puts all of this right in check, right together. So 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 1, 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in, what's that say? Flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So this message is called God's power revealed from heaven. This is the greatest instance that you will find in the Bible or in history of God's power revealed from heaven. Because who shows up? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the rapture, by the way. This is Jesus Christ coming back in his wrath. Notice it says in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. Now, if you're saved, do you have anything to worry about when he shows up? No, because notice the next statement vengeance on them that know not God and, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say they are punished. 
Once again, it's good to be on the Lord's side. Amen. Better make sure you know the Lord. People don't know the Lord and you know who they are. You ought to be telling them. Now go to Revelation 19. Let's just tie all this thing together here. Now, this is the chapter that everybody runs to. And it's, you should run to this chapter to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I thought that Thessalonians passage was really neat. How the wording there mentions fire, mentions vengeance. And you'll see this again over here in Revelation 19. So this last one is number seven. Not a thing, but a person revealed from heaven, Jesus Christ. And he comes with vengeance, with wrath upon, obviously, all his enemies. So look at verse 11. 1911. You probably read this many times, but this sure is neat. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Watch this little statement here. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Now, let me just stop here for a minute. Lots of folks today do not associate righteousness with judgment. In fact, they think they're quite the opposite, don't they? The reason why is because they want to get away with things. But notice that God's righteousness goes along with judgment. And then notice something even more interesting. It says in righteousness, he doth judge and do what? Make war. You mean to tell me there's such thing as a just war? Oh, yeah. Throughout history, there's been some. I wouldn't say all wars, but there have been some. This war that the Lord Jesus Christ is declaring is a just war. It's the righteous against the unrighteous. It's deserved. So look at uh, the description here. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called, hey, we saw that on Sunday morning, Sunday, uh, Sunday school. The Word of God, another title for Jesus Christ. See it in Revelation 19. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Watch this. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, that is a great day. I, I believe you could say that's the greatest day in history. Amen? That's the day where Jesus Christ comes back, takes vengeance on his enemies, sets up his kingdom for how long? 1,000 years. So this is a good place to end here. Something that was mentioned in our prayer request here the last few weeks, and we should be praying. We pray for elections to be done in a just manner, in a righteous manner, correct? And we were very disappointed here a few years ago, and uh, there's probably disappointment down the road, possibly. And you can, I think in the heart of everybody, both saved and unsaved, in the heart, God has put in the heart of folks a desire for justice justice from a leader political leader would you agree we all want that i say all most folks want that i think all you do a lot of other folks want that as well and the leader that finally is just and righteous is not elected think about that he just shows up at the right time and when he shows up, it's just and righteous, and his kingdom is just and righteous. And oh, isn't it going to be a great thing for 1,000 years to not have to look at the TV and say, what is this politician going to say today? What's going to happen to the gas prices tomorrow? What's going to happen with a loaf of bread and how much I got to pay the next day? Folks, everything done in that 1,000 years is done the right way. You don't have to worry about any kind of shenanigans behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about corruption in government. Amen? This will be the most righteous government in history. This is what people have longed for. This is what the communists attempted to do. But obviously they failed miserably. Jesus Christ will set things straight. And to end here, where does he come from? He comes from heaven to earth. Is it judgment or blessing when he comes back? Depends on what side you're on.
right? For us, blessing, amen. For others that don't know him, judgment. And I think that really fits all those other objects that we saw coming down from heaven to earth. So I don't know what's next, but we'll see what the Lord uh, says is next. And uh, that's been kind of fun, though, dealing with all that stuff from space and earth and in between. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just the neat things you show us in the scriptures and also the things that we look forward to happen in the future. Lord, we long for the day when Jesus Christ shows up. We long for the day where we spend time with you in heaven and then come back with you down to this earth. And things are the way they should be for a thousand years. And I pray that in the meantime, however short or long that time is, you find us here in this local church to be faithful to you, faithful to your word. You know, it's really easy. I, I fall in the trap like a lot of folks are just uh, complaining about our situation politically. And I pray that we would instead just substitute that with prayer and trust in you. And just look forward to that day again where things are set straight by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we thank you for the group here this evening. Thank you for uh, just being able to spend some time together in your word. We ask your hand of protection on us as we go. We ask for your wisdom to prevail with us in the days ahead as we need it desperately. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.